Since the dawn of science, men have been convinced that they knew the extent of the solar system. But then, an amateur astronomer was to make a discovery which doubled the size of the Sun's kingdom. This is the planet, now called Uranus. A mysterious world, even today. A rocket probe is on its way there. Voyager 2 should pass by Uranus in 1986 and enable these pupils of the Herschel High School in Slough to learn more about Herschel's planet than we know at present. As you know, 1981 is the bicentenary of Herschel's discovery of the planet Uranus in 1781. Bampton, what do you think was the most interesting thing that came across to you? It was a musician when he was younger. He was in the army. He was actually German. He came to England and he did a lot for England. It takes 84 years for Uranus to travel once around the sun. And through a telescope it appears as a greenish-blue disc. Quite a strange object in the sky then. That strange object in the sky is very far away and so faint that it's easier to draw than photograph. But Herschel's telescope showed it well. Herschel made all his own telescopes, and the telescope he used to discover Uranus was almost exactly like this one, which is a genuine Herschel telescope made at about the same time. The only possible difference being that this tube is mahogany, and the Uranus telescope may have been made of oak. In each case, the focal length is seven feet, and the mirror is six inches in diameter, and they were the best mirrors of their time. They were the best mirrors of their time because Herschel was a perfectionist and an optical genius. His interest in astronomy started here, in the city of Bath. And his great discovery was made from the garden of this house in New King Street. Herschel didn't have a permanent observatory at number 19, and we're not absolutely sure of the observing site. It could have been on the platform behind me, on that shelter to some extent, and no doubt Herschel liked to get as much shelter as he could when observing on a bleak winter night, and he never missed a night's observing, whether bleak or not. We don't know exactly what the weather was like on the evening of March the 13th, 1781, the night of his discovery, but we do have the notes he made. He was carrying out a systematic review of the heavens, and he was examining stars in the constellation of Gemini, the twins, when he came across something which definitely wasn't a star. For one thing, it showed a disk, which no star can do. And secondly, it moved slowly from night to night, which again, no star can do. So it had to be closer than a star. It had to be a member of the solar system. And Herschel mistook it for a comet. And his first report to the Royal Society was headed, An Account of a Comet. But when the orbit was worked out, initially by the Finnish mathematician Anders Lexel, it became quite clear that the object was not a comet. It was a planet moving way out beyond the path of the outermost planet then known, which of course was Saturn. It was an amazing demonstration of the care and skill with which Herschel was carrying out his survey of the sky. He had had no scientific training. His father Isaac, who was a musician in the Hanoverian foot guards, couldn't afford to send his son to university. So, 14-year-old Herschel joined the guards as an oboist. At that time, Hanover and England were under one crown. So, Friedrich Wilhelm Herschel was stationed briefly in England, and on his discharge in 1762, made his way back there to try his luck at a musical career. William, as he was now known, tried a number of posts before coming to Bath in 1766. At that time, Bath was at the zenith of its prosperity and was the most fashionable watering place in England. People flocked there, and new houses, inns, theatres and places of worship sprang up. Private chapels were built, such as the Octagon, where a fireside seat cost two guineas a quarter. Amongst its other attractions was a new organist, William Herschel. In the building which now houses the Royal Photographic Society, the man who was to discover a new planet, so far away that it's very hard to photograph in detail, played the organ. The organ of the Octagon Chapel was a magnificent instrument, and Herschel used it well. 
he built up a great reputation as a musician, and had he wished, he could have stayed here as organist. But of course, he didn't. Astronomy was coming to the fore. And what better place than Bath for a young man to branch out on his own line of thought? Of course, people came to Bath for its spa and entertainments. There was no livelier place in the whole of England. And Herschel, as a musician, was very much in the centre of the social world. But the city was also an intellectual centre, where the sciences were often discussed, including astronomy, which was attracting a growing band of enthusiasts. William was more than ordinarily interested, and once he'd turned his thoughts to the stars, it was inevitable that earning a living from music would no longer satisfy him. These are some of the pipes of the organ, now in the music room of 19 New King Street, where Herschel gave lessons. But all his spare time was taken up with astronomy. He read books, in particular, Astronomy by James Ferguson, the best popular astronomical writer of the time. James Ferguson began his career as a shepherd boy. He was quite untaught, and he ended up as a fellow of the Royal Society. And this particular book, Astronomy Explained Upon Sir Isaac Newton's Principles, ran to quite a number of editions. Herschel got one, and he was fascinated. He read the famous book by Smith, Optics. Telescopes were not cheap, and Herschel wasn't a rich man. So the first thing to do was to borrow one, and this he was able to do. And in his diary he says, There being in one of the gallantry shops for the accommodation of visitors at Bath, a two and a half foot Gregorian telescope to be let, it was for some time taken in requisition and served not only for viewing the heavens, but for making experiments in its construction. Well, that was a small reflector made by the famous optician James Short, who incidentally used to sell three-inch telescopes for the price of three guineas. Herschel tried this telescope, and he liked it, and he thought, therefore, he would set about making telescopes of his own. Now, at that point, he had a stroke of luck. There had been, in Bath, a, a Quaker gentleman who had started making mirrors and had given it up. So he had quite a lot of material for sale, and Herschel was able to buy it. And he says he bought all his rubbish, tools, hones, polishers, unfinished mirrors, etc., all for small Gregorians, and none above two or three inches in diameter. Well, that didn't satisfy him either. He began making experiments on his own account, and he ground mirrors. He had over 200 failures, and eventually he did produce a mirror, which was tolerably good in his own words, and he used it to look at the planet Saturn. That was in 1774. In 1779, he recorded, so much time was taken up with my astronomical preparations that I reduced the number of my students to three or four per day. If he were too busy to teach, he was certainly too busy to look after himself. Fortunately, his sister, Caroline, arrived from Hanover, and who better to describe her role in William's life than his great great-granddaughter, also called Caroline Herschel. Well, it was William who was responsible for bringing her to England from Hanover. Yes, and I think she was very pleased to come because she wasn't awfully happy at home. She was the last of ten children, I think, Isaac had. <clears throat> and unfortunately, when she was young, about eight or nine, something of that sort, she got smallpox, mm. and it disfigured her very much, and her mother wasn't too kind to her by emphasizing the fact that she got this scars on her face that she wasn't likely to marry. Ah, seems rather rough. Oh, very. So that she did lead a slightly difficult early life and was wanted more than anything to take up music and sing. She had a good voice. Well, of course, she fitted very well into the Bath musical circle. I know she gave quite a lot of concerts here. It's sad that there was no way of recording Caroline's own voice. She was talented and might have had a successful singing career. But duty and affection for her brother came first. She was needed at home. When William was polishing a mirror, it meant going on for many hours without stopping at all, not even for meals. 
You're absolutely right. He'd go on sometimes right, th right through a day and a night, never stopping. And that was where Caroline came in to feed him. <coughs> and I don't quite know what she gave him, but she did keep him going while he was polishing. Thanks to Caroline, he had a meal, and he also had entertainment of a book that she used to read to him. Now, this was quite a heavy job. In Herschel's time, it wasn't possible to make large mirrors out of glass. They had to be made out of specular metal, which was an alloy of copper and tin. And clearly, the first thing to be done uh, was to melt the metal. And that involved building a furnace, uh, which Herschel did in the lower workshop of number 19, New King Street. And this was the place where the furnace was. Uh, note the bellows. The metal was put, first of all, into a tray on the furnace and heated to incandescence. When everything was ready, it was ladled out from the furnace into a mould made of horse dung, which was on the floor here. The idea being that when the metal cooled down, it would form the blank from which the mirror was ground. That was the procedure, and normally it worked very well. But uh, there were occasions when things went wrong. Once there was a leak, neither the furnace or the mould, or possibly both, and the molten metal poured out onto the flagstones. The metal turned into steam, and the flagstones literally exploded. And there was a whole series of explosions, and metal actually hurtled upward toward the ceiling. Luckily, there were two doors in the workshop. Herschel went hastily out of one, and his assistants out of the other. Nobody was, in fact, hurt, but um, it must have been quite a moment. He survived, and the end result of all these trials and tribulations was an optically precise design whose superb engineering is impressive even by modern standards. There used to be a finder here, I don't know where that is now, and there is the eyepiece, and Herschel did normally use very high magnifications. It's a very handsome looking telescope indeed, and it's got one or two very interesting features. For example, it has slow motions. You've got a slow motion in right ascension, as to follow objects as they go across the sky from east to west. You've also got a slow motion in declination, that's up or down. And if you want to move the telescope quickly, either up or down, well you can do that too. Bring the tube up in that way. All quite simple. And if you want to move quickly in right ascension, well that's no problem either, you simply turn the entire mounting round. And that was easy, because the telescope was designed to be, and is, really portable. It was just as well it was portable. Uranus had made Herschel famous overnight, and professional astronomers were anxious to examine his telescopes. Among those interested was the Astronomer Royal, Neville Maskelyne. And from the Royal Observatory at Greenwich, William wrote triumphantly home. These two last nights, I've been stargazing at Greenwich with Dr. Maskelyne and Mr. Orbit. We have compared our telescopes together, and mine was found very much superior to any of the Royal Observatory. Double stars they could not see with their instruments, I had the pleasure to show them very plainly, and my mechanism is so much approved of that Dr. Maskelyne has already ordered a model to be taken from mine, and a stand to be made by it to his reflector. He is, however, now so much out of love with his instrument that he begins to doubt whether it deserves a new stand. I can now say that I absolutely have the best telescopes that were ever made. Any astronomer will want to test a claim like that, and George III, who had a private observatory at Kew, was no exception. Naturally, the king wanted to meet this fellow Hanoverian who had discovered a new planet. William was summoned to Windsor and wrote to Caroline. Last night the King, the Queen, the Prince of Wales saw my telescope and it was a very fine evening. My instruments giving a general satisfaction. The King was, has very good eyes and enjoys observationing with telescope exceedingly. This evening, as the King and Queen had gone to queue, the princesses were desirous of seeing my telescope but wanted to know if it was possible to see without going out on the grass, and were much pleased when they heard that my telescope could be carried into any place they liked best. When the evening appeared to be totally unpromising, I proposed an artificial Saturn. This being accepted with great pleasure, I had the lamps lighted up, 
which illuminated the picture of Saturn out in the park. I had beforehand prepared this little piece. The effect was fine and so natural that the best astronomers might have been taken in. <laughs> well, first of all, he yes. was nothing if not resourceful. Yes, he was, as a matter of fact. He ends up the letter with, um, tomorrow evening, they hope to have better luck and nothing will give me greater happiness than to be able to show them some of the most beautiful objects with which the heavens are so gloriously ornamented. That, I think, is a very characteristic remark because he was a, a humanist among all things and really appreciated beauty. Herschel accepted the king's offer to become his private astronomer at the reasonable salary of 200 pounds per year. It meant professional status. Herschel had no need to go on earning his living by music. But of course, it was still a very important part of his life. And the king also was interested in music. And Herschel used to come here to Windsor Castle, to St. George's Chapel, and there he used to play the organ. He was playing the organ one time, probably enjoying himself, and up by the altar is one, one large pillar under which they rather imagined that King Edward IV was buried. And to their joy and surprise, they found the coffin. John Fisher, the dean of St. George's and a great friend of William, said to him, look, would you like to have a piece of hair from Edward the Fourth. Hmm. And William said, my word, I've got a piece here that I can show you. Oh. This is something he was given, um, the hair. Inside there, but it's... And you can see the hair. It's red. It's red. And of course, Edward the Fourth was a red-headed king. There was one condition attached to his new post. He had to be on hand when the king needed him and his telescopes. That meant being within easy reach of the castle. And Herschel finally found a spot where he and his sister set up a home they called Observatory House. It was in Slough. In those days, a quiet village, ideal for observing. It's very different now. But Herschel has certainly not been forgotten by the residents of modern Slough. Every year the second form at Herschel High School 